you know, but, but this is National Sunday and tomorrow's National Day. And so I thought it would be good for us to start off with this question. And again, if you're online, just, just type it in the chat. But what's one thing that you're grateful for in Singapore? Come on. What's one thing? Just shout it out if you're here. Food. Yes, that was top of my list too. Food. What kind of food are you grateful for? That's exactly what I smelled when I came out of my car. Man, I love the location of this church because I could smell the durian, the heavenly fruit. You know, what else are we grateful for? Sorry, security? Yeah, that's, that's good. Anything else? You know, I, 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 again, I've been traveling uh, and, and I've been going to different places, um, staying in different places. I'm so grateful for the infrastructure that we have in Singapore. I'm grateful that you don't need a car to get anywhere in Singapore. You, you've got gr- we've got great public transport. You know, we've got most places we have are air conditioned. You know, it's, it's amazing, right? And, and I'm just so grateful for that. And I think as we start off this day, leading to tomorrow, I think we need to come back to this place of gratitude. Because how many of you know, sometimes we forget what we have until we lose it. You know, and so we need to be grateful. But, but more than that, the second question I want to ask us today is what's one thing that Singaporeans are known for? Sorry? Complain. Is that what someone said? Kiasu. Kiasi. Anybody else uh, uh, online? Any, any, if you want, you can type it in. I'll read it out for you. you know, but any, anything else that Singaporeans are known for? That's it. Wow, very sad, right? Complain, kiasu, kiasi. Singlish, yes, that's a good one. Yeah, we, there was a point in time where we didn't want to show off our Singlish, but now, wow, everybody wants to show off Singlish, right? It, it, it's, it's a valued part of our society. You know, we, we're known for quite a few things. Um, in fact, in Singapore, we're known, depending on the generation, you know, some people know us because of crazy rich Asians, uh, other people know us because of Pua Chu Kang, especially with his latest vaccination song. Uh, we, we're known for many, many things. We're known for our Singlish. We're known for queuing up. How many of you have queued for something and you don't know what you're queuing for, but you just saw the queue? And so you thought you'd just join in? You know, we're known for many things as a nation. We're known for our great infrastructure. We're known for turning a country from a third world or a developing nation to a first world nation in a short period of time. We're known for a lot of things as a nation. But I love what someone said. In fact, it was the first thing that came out. We're known to complain. We're known to complain. We, we know that. You know, or someone wrote here, Jasmine wrote, you know, we're known for being super smart. Our students are super smart. PSLE. Uh, with that, we're also known for being super stressed, right? Super smart, super stressed. Uh, but, but yet, we're known for many things. And one of the things that we're known for is complaining. In fact, when you look in the news over the last few weeks, we've seen a lot of things. Olympian never make it to semifinals? Complain. <laughs> right? Phase 2 heightened alert? Complain. Oh, easing of restrictions. Yesterday, the news, or two days ago, the news came out. Complain, right? Ah, yeah, why they never ease in more? Ah, yeah, why they never ease less? Ah, yeah, why they never put us to phase one? Ah, yeah, why they never put us to phase three? Why, why they never make phase four? I mean, we love to complain. No matter what people do, there is something to complain about. There is something to complain about. We, we love to complain. We love to complain. And this is something that we, we must wrestle with as a nation. And I believe that the word that God has for us today is that He wants us to seek the welfare of the city. That instead of being known as a city or as a nation of complainers, we want to be known as a city and a nation of builders. We want to be known as someone who is looking for the welfare of others around us. And this is the word that I believe that God has for us today. And so if you have your Bibles with me, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4. And we're going to be reading all the way to verse 9. Okay, so Jeremiah 29 verse 4 to 9. It's going to be on the screen, but again, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open it up to turn to it because we will be referring back to it throughout our time together. There is nothing like the Word of God. And so reading from verse 4, this is Jeremiah speaking to the people of Israel, and he says this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile, 
from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. And this is the main verse, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And in verse 8, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets or your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Will you join me as we commit this time to the Lord together in prayer? God, we want to thank you for the reading of your word. God, we thank you that it is a word that brings life. It is a word which is powerful. It is a word which will not fall to the ground, but it is a word that will plant and will take root and it will bear fruit in each and every one of our lives. And for that, we want to give you praise. God, we pray that our hearts will be open to you today, that your word will speak and it will bring forth transformation like never before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now we're reading from Jeremiah chapter 29. Right? And most of the time, when you think of Jeremiah chapter 29, what verse do you think of? Verse 11. Most of us think of verse 11, right? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, to give you hope and a future. And, and that's the first verse we think of when we go to verse 11. In fact, in my dad's church, I just found out, they, they, no, in another church, they're doing verse 11 right now. You know, but, but yet, there is something important because we must recognize the context in which this letter was written in which this word was given to the people. In fact, it was a letter, it was a word to the exiles in Babylon. This was something that they wrote to the exiles in Babylon. And this is, again, it's a very powerful thing because if you turn to, again to your Bible, to Jeremiah chapter 29, in verse 1, the Bible says this, These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. You see, the important thing we need to recognize here is that this letter was written to exiles in Babylon. What does this mean? That means the Israelites weren't at home. They weren't comfortable. Where were the Israelites when they received this word? They were on an enemy territory. They were in enemy land. They were taken captive. That means they didn't go there by choice. They were forced to go there. Now, how many of you know if you are forced to go somewhere that you don't want to go, you don't want to stay there. You don't want to, you don't want to be there. And again, you have to put yourself in the shoes or the sandals of the Israelites in this time when they receive this word in order to understand what God is trying to say. You see, when the letter was being written, when this word went forth to the people in Israel, God was actually telling them three things in this word. The first was this, as you are in the land of your enemies, don't seek their destruction. Don't seek their destruction. Now, you have to, again, whenever we read the Bible, we must read it in its context. And when you look at Jeremiah chapter 27 and Jeremiah chapter 28, there was a prophet by the name of Hananiah who was going out there and speaking the word. And his word was that God would come and destroy Nebuchadnezzar and he will set the Israelites free. Okay, and there was this talk that God was going to come and crush the head of King Nebuchadnezzar. And again, put yourself in the shoes or the sandals of the Israelites. What would you wish upon your enemy when you've been taken captive? You would wish for their destruction. They're the enemy. Not, not only are they the enemy of God's people, they are the enemy of God. And so what we want to do as an Israelite people, as a community, is we want to seek the destruction of the enemy. But yet again, the Word of God is so interesting because He speaks to them. In fact, the Word of God rebukes this mindset and says, don't seek their destruction. But He doesn't stop there because He says, not only are you called to not just seek their destruction, you're called to not seek your own escape. I love this. You read again in the passage, especially verse 8 and 9 of chapter 29. The Bible says, don't let the false prophets and the diviners deceive you. Those who tell you that 
you will be set free. Those who give you a dream that I will break the yoke of Babylon over you. Isn't it interesting? And, and this is powerful for us because, again, the people of Israel, they've been taken captive. They know that God is victorious. They know that God has a promise, a plan, and a purpose for their life. Verse 11. And yet the Bible says, God says to them, but in this promise, I don't want you to seek the destruction of your enemies and I don't want you to seek your own escape from this imprisonment and this captivity. Instead, what I want you to do is I want you to seek the welfare of the city. Wow. Whenever I read the Bible, it reminds me of Psalm 139. Oh Lord, will you search my heart and see if there's anything grievous or offensive in me and offend me. Can I tell you, as a people of Israel, this would have been an offensive word. Because I've been just been taken captive. We've just lost, the, we've seen the temple destroyed. I want revenge. I want to see God glorified. I want to escape from this curse and this destruction and I want to be set free. And God looks at them and says, don't seek the destruction of your enemies and don't seek your own escape. Instead, what I want you to do is I want you to seek the welfare of the city that you're in. It's a powerful word. What, what is God trying to say to us in our context? Because that's what God was saying to the people of Israel. What does this mean for us? In our context, it means this, and if there's one point you want to remember for the entire message, it's this, that we are called to seek the welfare of all in our city. We are called to seek the welfare of all in our city. It was the word that God gave to the people of Israel, and it's the same word that God is giving to us, even as we're getting ready to celebrate National Day tomorrow. Now, what do we mean by this? What does the word welfare mean in the Bible? Now, in the Hebrew, you'll be surprised to actually know that this word is the word that we know as shalom. It is the word prosperity. It is the word peace. It is the word completeness. It is the word wholeness. In other words, when you read this verse, in verse 7 it says, seek the peace, seek the prosperity, seek the wholeness, seek the completeness of the city in which you are in. It is our responsibility, it is our call, it is our commission, it is the command that God has given to each and every one of us. We are called to seek every single one of those things in our city. But it doesn't stop there because what does the city mean? What does it mean to be the city? What does it mean to seek the welfare of the city? What, does, what is the city? Now the word city in the Hebrew, it means two things. Number one, it means the city. So the whole area, it means the infrastructure, it means the government, it means it, it's the collective whole. But it also refers to the people in the city. Now when you translate this back to our lives, you know what this means for us? We are called to seek the peace and the prosperity and the wholeness and the completeness, not just of our nation. We're called to seek that for our workplace. We're called to seek that for our homes. We're called to seek that for our schools. We're called to seek that for our church. We're called to seek it for every individual that we come into contact with. It even includes the neighbours in your residential area. We are called to seek the welfare of the city. And again, this is a powerful truth because it's not just of those we like in the city. It is all in the city. Now you may say, but, but, but Pastor, I don't like this particular, but, or I've got this neighbour. I've got this neighbour who, who throws rubbish in the common rubbish area, but they don't put it in the chute, so it's always outside in my house. Pastor, you need to understand, my house is right next to the chute, and they bring ends, you know, into my house. Am I supposed to seek the welfare of them? Because what I want to do is, I want to take photo, I want to put on Instagram, I'm going to hashtag their unit number, <laughs> hashtag HDB and URA, so that everybody knows who they are. And then sometimes we're even more spiritual, right? Oh, no, 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 but pastor, you know why I'm doing it? It's for the welfare of my HDB blog, right? But yet we do that. But we're called to seek the welfare of all. Again, it is confronting because this word was given to the Israelites, not for the Israelites. They weren't supposed to seek the welfare of the Israelites in the city. 
They were supposed to seek the welfare of the Babylonians in the city. The very ones who destroyed their temple, the very ones who took them captive by force, the very ones who dragged them across the land into a foreign land, the very ones who forced them to learn another language, to learn another culture, to be slaves, they were called to seek the welfare of those in the city. Wow. Again, I don't know about you, but when I read this word, God reminds me that sometimes in our lives, instead of wanting to seek the welfare of those in our city, we try to seek their destruction. In fact, sometimes we try to seek our escape. I've heard of many Singaporeans. Oh, the moment borders open, I'm just going to move country. Lah. <laughs> right? Lockdown here, lockdown there. No, what are they doing? We're trying to seek our escape. Others, oh, if only the government can change. Oh, if only this can happen. I have only my boss can change. Oh, yeah. Wait until the bigger bosses find out what my boss is doing. Oh, then, oh. Gone. Then maybe I'll become the new boss. What are we doing? We're seeking their destruction. Oh, if only I could get out of this job. Or worse still, please don't raise your hand if this is you. If only I could get out of this family. What's that? Seeking our own escape. But what God has called us to do is that regardless of our circumstance, regardless of our situation, regardless of how we feel, we are called to seek the welfare of those in our city. We're called to seek the welfare of those in our workplace, especially the colleague who just backstabbed you and stole your project. We're called to seek the welfare of those in our church. We're called to seek the welfare of those in our family especially the mum who you feel doesn't understand what you're going through, or the child who you feel is just rebellious and just wants to, everything you say, they do the opposite. We're called to seek their welfare. We're called to seek the welfare of our nation. Whether we agree or disagree with our governmental leaders, we're called to seek their welfare. But again, the challenge is that sometimes instead of wanting to seek their welfare, we want to seek their destruction or we want to escape from it all. It's not my problem. Let someone else handle it. You know what is the latest form of escape now in our society? It's the phone. Oh, that's a problem. Let's just YouTube. Let's just Netflix. Let's just go to social media. Now, it's not bad, but when we use it as a form of escape, we're missing out on the call that God has given to us, which is to seek the welfare of those in our city. And so the main thing that I want to share with us today is this. We are all called to seek the welfare of all in our city. But then it leads us to the next question, because how do we do that? How can we seek the welfare of all in our city? And again, the prophet Jeremiah puts it very plainly for us. In fact, I love it because whenever a prophet speaks, it's not the prophet who's telling us what to do, it's God. Because it's the Word of God. And God actually lays out this blueprint, this plan. How can we seek the welfare of our city? And I just want to walk us through it today because I believe that God is going to challenge us and God's going to convict us and God's going to move us to be people who will seek the welfare of our city. Again, not just the nation, but the community that we're a part of. We are called to seek the welfare. We will be seekers of the welfare of the city in which we have been placed in by God. And so number one, the first thing that we can do is to be planted. Everybody say, be planted. Be planted. You know, in verse 4, the Bible says this, in verse 4. No, in fact, it's verse 5. In verse 5, the Bible says that we are called to be planted wherever we are. In verse 5, again, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 5, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. You know what this speaks to us about? Again, it challenges because, remember, there are a few responses that we have whenever we don't like our city, whenever the circumstances come against us, one of which is to escape. And I love it because God knows that. God knows what the Israelites were thinking. We want to escape. We want to leave Babylon. We just can't wait to go back to Jerusalem. And he looks at them and says, no, no, no. Build houses. Wait, God, what? Like, you mean like 10 temporary house? Or No, no, no. Build houses and plant gardens. See, the moment you want to plant gardens, you know that it's not short-term, it's long-term. 
You can't plant a garden for like a few months and then go home. Right? You're planting a garden for, a, for years to come. And, and he was challenged. He said, no, no, what I want you to do is I want you to plant gardens. And we know this with hindsight because it was about 70 years that he had to be there. Right? But again, we are called to plant gardens. We are called to be planted. We can't escape. You see, another way to look at this is this. If God has placed you in a situation, you will never be able to blossom unless you're planted. You can never blossom if you're not rooted. You must be rooted. You must be able to absorb the nutrients if you, if you know anything about gardening. In order for a plant to bear fruit, it has to be planted. And in the same way, if we want to seek the welfare of our city, we need to be planted. This means that you shouldn't, if it's a work scenario, and you're just waiting to escape, you can't stand your boss, you can't stand your colleagues, you can't stand what's going on with the culture in the workplace. If God is calling you to seek the welfare of the city, of that workplace, don't look for another job. Be planted. Don't stay there just because you can't find another job. Be planted. Make a difference. Build relationships. If you're, if, you're in a, if you're staying in a residential area, can I tell you one of the ways you can be planted is to be present and to make friends and to build relationships with your neighbours. It's not just being there and, and just in and out. You actually have to be planted. Now this is, don't worry, the, the government didn't pay me to say this, but, but one way to be planted is take part in the residential community events. Now you may say, wow, but it's so boring. But that's one of the ways you can be planted. One of the things that God has challenged me to do in the last one year is to leave my door open so that I can see my neighbours walk past the corridor and say hello. I didn't like it because, you know, I wanted to be comfortable in whatever clothes I wore or not wear or whatever, right? And, but yet I felt this call that if I want to make a difference, if I want to make, if I want to seek the welfare, I need to be planted. I need to build relationships. I don't like talking to people in the lift, but I feel like one of the ways that God's challenging me to be planted is to say hello to the neighbors who walk in the lift and to greet them and to talk to them and to find out more about their lives. It's not about telling them about Jesus straight away, but it's about being planted. We have to be planted. See, there's a difference between being planted and being on the ground. It takes effort to be planted. If you want to be planted, you have to take a seed, you have to dig the ground, and then you have to put it in the ground, and then you have to water it, and you have to do all this. But if you take a seed and you just leave it on the ground, that's easy. That's called being on the ground. See, God doesn't call us to be on the ground. He calls us to be planted in the ground. See, we are called to be planted, and that's the first thing that we need to do. Is it hard? Does it take effort? Absolutely yes. But it's what God is calling us to do. You know how much effort it took for the Israelites to build houses and to plant gardens? If you thought building a house in Singapore is difficult, imagine trying to build it in a foreign land with a foreign language with people who don't even like you. It's even harder when you're a second class, third class, when you're considered a captive, a, an exile. But they were called to plant. They were called to plant. The second thing that we need to do is we need to be productive. We need to be productive. Again, the Bible says this in verse 6. You see, take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply and do not decrease. You see, they were called not just to be planted. They were called to be productive. They were called to give back. They were called to sow back. They were called to look for the welfare of those around them. And what does this mean for us? It means that we're not just there to be there. We're there to help other people be who God wants them to be. We're called to help our nation be the nation God wants it to be. And again, I know as Christians, sometimes we lean very quickly to this place of being spiritual and, and we want the nation to be saved and we want them to, to know the glory of God and all of those things are good. But can I tell you, God's not just interested in the salvation of this land. He is very interested, but He is not just interested. He wants the nation to prosper. He wants the nation to do what He has called the nation to do. And one of the ways in which we as Christians need to move in that is we need to get in line with what God wants to do. 
Not just in the spiritual realm, but in the physical realm. You see, we need to be productive. This means that if you're in your workplace, be productive. If you're in school, be productive. Be productive in your studies. Be productive in your work. You don't like it? Ask God to change your heart. We need to be productive. But again, it's more than just what we are producing in our lives. It's what we're producing in the lives of other people. See, I love this. When he says, seek the welfare of the city, again, they would have thought of the Babylonians. This means that they were trying to prosper the Babylonians. So you don't like your work, you don't like your boss, help them to prosper. You don't like that family member who always, gets on, who always disagrees with you, who always gets on your back for certain things. Seek their welfare. Speak life, not death. Be constructive, not destructive. You see, you can't expect growth if you're not invested. You can't expect growth if you don't sow. Because at the end of the day, you will reap what you sow. So if you sow death, you will reap death. But if you sow life, even in the place of death, you can trust that in God's beautiful timing, you will reap life. You see, we need to be productive. We need to see and look around in the city that we're in, in our residential area, in, in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our school, in our family, in our church, in our nation. What can we do? Or what is God calling us to do to add value in the lives of the people around us? How can we add value? How can we be productive? How can we produce not just the fruit of the Spirit, but how can we produce the fruit that God has called into their lives. What can we do? And so the first is to be planted, the second is to be productive, and the third is we are to be prayerful. We are to be prayerful. Again, verse 7, seek the welfare of the city, but he doesn't end there, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. You see, if you want to seek the welfare of the city, you can be planted and you can be productive, but I tell you this, if you're not prayerful, it's not going to bear fruit. You know why? Because the place of prayer, most of us when we think of prayer, we think of this place of prayer as depending on God, relying on God, asking God to move. And that is a part of what it means to pray. But there's another part which I think is one of the most important things because the place of prayer is the place where we catch the heart of God for what we're praying for. You see, if you're just planted and you're just productive and you're not prayerful, you may end up becoming bitter with, at God and at the people that you're trying to be planted in and productive for. Why? Because the heart's not right. That's why we need to pray. You see, when I first started opening my door, when I first started talking to my neighbors, can I tell you, it felt like a chore. In fact, one of the things my wife and I started to do was if it's a public holiday, or a big event, and we forgot to do it for National Day, which is tomorrow. But like Christmas, or Chinese New Year, or Hari Raya, we try to get little goodie bags, and, and we just distributed it to all our neighbors on our lift landing, okay, on, the, on the floor that I stay on. And the first time I did it, it felt like a bit fake. Lah. Like, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing it, right? I thought it would be good. Second time I did it, I thought, wow, you faker times two. Right? You, you're doing it again, right? Now it feels good because sometimes the neighbors reciprocate. Right? But, but the more I've been doing it, the more I've been trying to, to, to reach out and, and talk to them and build relationships, try to find out their names, every time I did it, it felt like, like I didn't feel it. Like I was doing it here, but I wasn't doing it here. And then I realized why. Because I was doing something, but I wasn't praying about it. And so my mind was active, but my heart was disconnected. But the more I began to pray, the more I began to pray, the more I began to pray. You see, prayer is not so much about moving the hand of God. It's about God moving the heart of man. That's what prayer is. You see, God knew that if you were just to ask the people of Israel, be planted and be productive, they would have most likely disobeyed him. Or if they obeyed him, they may have burnt out. So he said this, seek the welfare of the city and pray. Because the place of prayer is the place that, change, that will change your heart. And when your heart changes, the way you plant yourself and the way that you produce the things I'm calling you to produce will change. 
You see, we need to be prayerful. We must be prayerful. But again, this is the challenge for us. Because sometimes we know that we're called to seek the welfare of the city. But sometimes we're just so busy trying to do things for ourselves that we fail to do things for others. We're so busy looking out for our own welfare, our own peace, our own prosperity, our own wholeness. You know, we all have problems. We all have shortcomings. We all have issues that we're navigating through. And sometimes it feels like, but God, you, why? You're too much. Eh? You, you, you already know I've got so many problems that you want me to help the problems of others. And that may have been exactly what the people of Israel may have felt. God, do you not know we just lost the temple? We just lost our families. We, were just, we just lost our land. And you want us to seek the welfare of the city. You know what God says in verse 7? For in the welfare of the city, you will find your welfare. Isn't that interesting? You see, at the end of the day, when it comes to the kingdom of God, it's not just about you. It's about God and it's about other people. And when we begin to live like that in community, if everybody's looking out for each other's welfare, you can be sure that someone's looking out for your welfare. And God will use that to meet you in your place of need. You see, it's not just about you. It is, but it's not. It's about God and it's about other people. It's about the welfare of others. You see, Mahatma Gandhi says this, and I love him. He, he's a great man. In fact, one of the things that he said is that if, if it weren't for Christians, he would have become a Christian. He said, you know what? I have no issue with following your Christ, but when I see the Christ followers, it gets me to doubt who Christ was. But one of the things that Mahatma Gandhi said is that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. That's exactly what it means to seek the welfare of your enemies. And if you're called to seek the welfare of your enemies, then it equates to you're called to seek the welfare of everybody. Because that's the hardest level to reach. See, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. But I, I like this because while well, Mahatma Gandhi said this years ago, did you know that Jesus said the same thing thousands of years before him? You see, everything good we find in the world, we find its root in God. Because in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, it says, For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, if you go to your Bibles in Matthew chapter 16, it's not on the screen, but Matthew chapter 16, verse 25, I want you to highlight this part. For my sake. You see, if you lose your life for any other sake, you will still lose it. But if you lose your life for the sake of Christ, and what he calls us to do, and what he's done for our lives, we will find it. You see, we are called not just to live for ourselves, but we're called to live for God and for other people. And as I bring this message to a close, I, I pray that, that we won't just be stirred by the idea of wanting to seek the welfare of our city, but we'll actually be stirred to seek the welfare of the city to actually do something about it. And with this, there's one question that I want to end off with today. One question that I want to invite us to come to this place of just presenting ourselves to God because at the end of the day, it's not me that's speaking, it's the Spirit of God that has to speak. And so whether you're here with us in person or, or you're here online, I want you to ask yourself this question. What is God calling me to do for the city? And as you ask that question, again, if you're taking notes, I want you to ask yourself another question. Who in the city is God calling me to do it for? What does the city represent for me? Maybe God's calling you to do something for the nation. Maybe God's calling you to do something for your work. Maybe God's calling you to do something for your church or your neighborhood or, or your family members or your friends. The friend that you've not met for two years before COVID. And the second question is then, God, what do you want me to do for them? How do you want me to seek their welfare? And as you ask that question, and as you allow the Spirit of God to speak to you, you know, I know sometimes we Christians, we, we're big dreamers. And because we're big dreamers, we get great disappointments and great discouragement. Can I tell you, even if it's something as small as just dropping them a message to say hello, it's enough. 
It's okay to start small. Because the Bible says that if you are faithful in the little, you'll be faithful in much. Sometimes we're so quick, right? We're so eager, eager beaver. We're all ready to, to, to be faithful in the much, but we've yet to be faithful in this little. Can I tell you, it's okay to start small. Ask God, don't, don't feel intimidated. Oh, I have to volunteer for resident committee. No, 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 just, just, just talk to your neighbor. Oh, I have to talk to my neighbor. No, 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 just, just, just start praying for them. Right? You don't have to feel compelled. In fact, that's why it's the place of asking God. It's that relationship that we have. God, what do you want me to do? You see, Oscar Wilde, a writer, says this, the smallest act of kindness is worth more than the greatest or the grandest intention. It means the smallest act of kindness is greater than the grandest intention, the greatest idea you ever have. If you don't start with something, it means nothing. And so ask yourself this. Ask God, God, what do you want me to do for the city? What do you want me to do for the city? And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just going to pray for us today. And as I pray, I want you to ask, God, what are you saying to me today? God, what do you want me to do? And then after that, I'll, I'll just lead us in a place of response together. But God, we want to thank you for your word. God, we thank you for this challenge that you're giving to us to preach and to seek the welfare of the city, to seek prosperity and peace. And God, we open our hearts to you and we say, Spirit of God, will you speak to us? Will you reveal to us the, the city that you're calling us to seek the welfare for? God, we pray that you will just show us different individuals and, and you'll show us what you desire us to do. God, we thank you that it's not a one-size-fits-all, but you're a God who is unique. You're a God who speaks to us individually. And so we open our hearts to you and we pray that even the rest of our time of response, that we'll be open and sensitive to the leading of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, with every head bow and every eye closed, you know, I sense that there are some of us here, and, and I'm just going to speak to a few groups of us today. But maybe as you're hearing this word and as you're, God is speaking, some of you here, you're, you're struggling to seek the welfare of those around you, specific things. Maybe something's happened, maybe, maybe it's a bad situation, a bad circumstance, and, and all you want to do is to either destroy it or to escape from it. But as you hear the word of God today, you feel the tugging of the Spirit saying, but I want you to seek the wealth, and you don't know how to do it. You, you don't even know if you're capable of doing it. Can I tell you, God knows. And God wants to change your heart. God, God wants you to surrender those situations to Him. And if that's you, wherever you are, I want you to just quickly lift up your hand and put it down, and, because I want to pray for you today. You know, if you know that you're struggling, this yes, I see that hand, I see that hand, hands are going up, if you know that you're struggling, you're struggling and, and you, don't, you, you just don't want to see the welfare, you'd rather just escape, you'd rather just remain status quo, will you just surrender it to God? Allow the love of God to consume your heart. Oh, Soraba Sikitriya. Now, that's the second group of us. Maybe you desire to seek the welfare of the city, but you feel inadequate. You feel like no matter what you do, you can't. Or you feel like you're not in the right place. You don't know what to do. Can I tell you today, God wants to stir faith in your heart. Because you've been chosen for such a time as this. And the promise that God has is that if you would be faithful in the little, you'll be faithful in the much. In fact, the promise is this, if you are faithful in the little, He will be faithful with much. Yeah. And if you know that word is for you and you feel like, you know, God, I need your anointing. God, I need your strength. God, I need your wisdom again. I want you to just lift up your hand and, and put it down. And yes, I see that hand. You know, you know, God, I want to answer this call, but I need your spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, God. God, we just want to thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Now, all across this place, why don't we all just stand? You know, if you were responding and you've responded to God, you know, in the next few moments, I want you to just begin to pray. 
I want you to just begin to surrender yourself to God. Whatever it may be, I want you to surrender it to God. Lift up your hands and surrender it to God. And we're just going to pray corporately together as a body of Christ. And then after that, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. I'm going to pray over us that this church will be a church that will seek the welfare of the city. That this church will not be limited by time, nor space, nor the struggles of this world, nor the things of the emotions that we may feel, but we will be empowered and released to do the things that God has called us to do. Oh, Rabba Soko, Rabba Come on, come on, all across this place. Just begin to lift our voices. Begin to just cry out to God. Begin to surrender yourself to Him. Begin to say, God, God, I avail myself to seek the welfare of the city. God, I avail myself to seek the welfare of my workplace, of my family, of my church. God, you know the struggles that I have. You know the inadequacies that I feel. You know how I I've, I've, I've felt like I failed time and time again. But God, give me strength. God, give me courage. God, will you stir up a new sense of expectation and a new sense of faith? Like never before. And so God, with our hands lifted up to you today, God, we receive your word. And God, we thank you that the word that you have deposited in our hearts, Lord, it will not return to you void. And God, we pray for every single person who is here. God, for those who may be struggling and who may be feeling like wanting to escape from this situation, from those who may be seeking the destruction of the others around them. God, we rebuke the lie of the enemy over their lives in Jesus' name. God, we pray that the Spirit of God will come and uplift them. God, we pray that there'll be a turning around, a renewing of our minds. The Lord, we will see your hand in each and every situation. And God, we will, we will catch the heart of God. God, I pray that these people will surrender their struggles to you and they will experience the freedom and the joy of the Lord like never before. And God, we lift up this entire church to you. Lord, we thank you for New Horizon Church. God, we thank you that you have called them for such a time as this to seek the welfare of the city that they're in whether it be in this area whether it be geographical whether it be the nation of Singapore whether it be their family or their friends or their workplace or their schools whatever situation that you've put them in God we recognize your hand we recognize that you're sovereign and we recognize that there is no one else better than them that you have chosen to put in that situation. And God, we pray that they will arise to the call that you've given to them, that they will seek the welfare of the city. And Lord, they will understand the times and they will understand that which your spirit is saying to them. And we believe that Lord, they have not just been called for a time like this, but they have been called to do the things that you have laid in their heart. And so Lord, we declare that faith will arise. God, we declare that there'll be a new wisdom, a new fresh anointing. And above all else, we will see the move of the Spirit of God like never before. And so we release it in Jesus' name. Come on, all across this place. I want you to just lift up your hands and I want you to pray for the city that you're in. I want you to pray. I want you to ask God, God, change my heart. I want you to begin to bless the city of Singapore. I want you to bless your workplace. I want you to bless. I want you to declare there is power in the tongue. There is power to speak life. Oh, Rabba Soko, Rabba Sikitriye, Rabba Sunde. Oh, Rabba Sikitriye. And so, Lord, as we move in authority that you've given to us today, God, we pray that there'll be a shift in our call. There'll be a shift in our center. Lord, there'll be a shift in the reason why we do what we do. Because we do it unto the name and the glory of Jesus Christ. And so, once again, God, I thank you for your word. But above all else, God, I thank you that your word doesn't end here, but your word continues with each day as you continue to speak to your people, as you continue to draw them and help them to grow in this place of seeking the welfare of the cities in which they're in. May your spirit always go before them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you.